having fun at Wasteland 23 so far. Yes. Hopefully. And there's a, there's a moot question, Art. <laughs> right. What happens at Wasteland stays at Wasteland. But it ends up on Facebook. Or ends up on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> so we are um, 23 Wastelands in, and we have with us the esteemed director of so many great classic films, both genre and some non-genre. And we're going to do a brief career retrospective here, and then we'll open it up to questions. Does that sound like fun, everybody? Yeah. All right. So if you, uh, we have mics. How slick is that? And it's on. It sure should be on. How's that? Hello? Hello? Now, Mr. Hendricks. Hello? Okay, cool. So, can you give us a little bit, um, like maybe some brief biographical information of where you grew up, etc., leading up to your start as a filmmaker? Uh, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Is this thing working? Yes. Working. Okay. Uh, I grew up in Philadelphia, which was a, a great preparation for a director. And uh, actually, I, I, um, I wanted to be a trumpet player. Sorry. Hey, Jesus. I wanted to be a professional classical trumpet player. Um, and uh, probably if I would have been just a little bit better, that's what I'd be doing. This. So I sort of refer to myself as a failed trumpet player. Um, uh, but I was always very interested in the arts. I decided to go to school uh, to be a chemical engineer, which was a huge mistake. <laughs> I immediately. And uh, I then became an English major because I wanted to, to write. Uh, and, um, and then at a certain point, with the help of certain drugs, I realized that words were meaningless. <laughs> that ended my writing career. Um, and uh, so film seemed like a good thing. And, and actually, um, I had the perfect background because film, cinema, is really two things. One, the main component is story. And if you're a writer, you understand as an English major, I understood that story. But the other thing is there's a, it's like music, because it occurs in time, as a micro rhythm, like break micro rhythm, micro rhythm being like the means of the song, being the structure. Um, and so I had that. So um, um, I, I never felt I was that strong on the visual end, but I really worked on it. Seriously, and then uh, I started making films in college. There was no film program, so I just basically ordered equipment and tried to figure out how it worked. Where were you? Where'd you go to school? Uh, Antioch College in the great state of Ohio, down in the south. That's um, awesome. Very liberal, liberal arts. Let's talk about Antioch for a moment. I went to Oberlin College, oh, really? which is a similar college, <laughs> yeah. also in Ohio. Um, Antioch made the national news in the 90s when they had the let's um, ask for permission before any kind of... But no, Antioch is a really interesting school. Do you want to talk about it briefly? Well, uh, fortunately, when I went there, you didn't have to ask permission. That <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, um, actually, Antioch was, was really um, very fundamental to who I am now. Because... Um, it was a place that very, very liberal, liberal arts college um, that stressed um, um, experiencing life, um, having a, an open mind. Um, I also spent a year living in the UK, uh, where we were encouraged to basically stop being American. No, like the culture that we were living in. Uh, and I've done films in India and Africa. Yep. Mexico and Europe and, and a lot of different cultures, it's really helping me be able to stay. What were the subjects of some of your first short films when you were in school and you started making films? Well, actually, um, the first film I did was, was just a 
silly little piece of art I got. It was obsessed with taking photographs of, of the girl. Um, uh, and it's a certain metaphysical connotations. The second film I did was probably the worst idea anyone has ever had. For uh, because I was an English major and I was kind of an intellectual, uh, and I was very into the poetry of William Butler Yeats, I decided to make this my next film a dramatization of a, of a short play written in verse that takes place in 15th century Ireland. I had certain highfalutin uh, intentions. I, I was a huge fan of, uh, uh, you know, that was in the uh, in the middle 60s, and I was a huge fan of the French New Wave, Godard, and Foucault, and I, I loved the French humanist filmmakers, I loved the French humanist and that's, that's kind of what I thought I would be doing. I, I didn't think that I would be standing in the, in the street in the middle of the night telling people how to kill each other. <laughs> well, what, what are your, um, you're credited as one of the writers on Tattooed Hitman. Did you actually participate in that? Uh, it's, it's very funny that you should ask that because um, I was at a film festival and I, uh, uh, Quentin Tarantino was there, and the first thing he said to me was, oh, you were the writer of Tattoo Hitman. <laughs> and, and actually, um, I wasn't. Um, uh, basically, uh, New Line, who was in the film distribution business at that point, uh, had bought the Tattoo Hitman, which was a, 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 kind of a, a Japanese uh, Yakuza film, and I did a trailer for it, and I also um, helped them dub it into English. And so I, I wrote the English version of the script, and we also we Americanized everybody's name um, because they didn't want it to sound too Japanese. Uh, it was Japanese movie. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, uh, I I was actually responsible for renaming uh, Shinichi Chiba Sunny Chiba. Street. The whole idea was well, I think we're in the. Yeah, we try to make it sound. Like well, how did you first get connected with New Line? New Line started out sort of distributing 16 millimeter prints to colleges, right? Or to like um, That's exactly right. Yeah, it was a very small company. Um, I I moved to New York, and uh, one of my friends said uh, because at that point I had done four short films. Um, short, uh, you know, one, one was two minutes, some of the others were 15 or 20 minutes, and he said, oh, there's two companies for me on cinema, and this girl I've been dating is working as a temp secretary there, why don't you go over there and make me go to Sorry, but I'm really not interested in distributing any of the shorts. It's a part of the short the shorts and there's fairly short features and whatever we need. But um, by the way, would you know anybody who could edit a trailer? And I said, yeah, me. <laughs> so he said, okay. And so we, we had this Czech movie called uh, The End of August in the Hotel Ozo. And uh, we basically went into somebody's editing room when they left for the weekend on Friday night and we stayed on until 6 o'clock a.m. on Monday. And we ended up becoming very good friends. Bob sort of adopted me and I ended up doing all the trailers and I did all the work. Bob always felt that every movie was the key. It's too long. It didn't matter what it was. Jack, I think you take 15 minutes out of this film. Or to cut it to get a decent rate of the PAA. And finally, at a certain point, uh, New One realized that it was getting too hard to, to make it just as a film distribution company. And they've basically been distributing it to universities. That was their, their main thing. Kind of, their, the whole thing was kind of the 
that they understood this younger market, this, this new market, uh, because film, film was suddenly ex exploding all over the market. Yeah. Yeah. Because none of them, there were very few film programs in the and, um, and so they, we, we were sitting around one night, and uh, one of the guys said, you know, we really need to start making films. If we could produce a low budget bar film, uh, we, we could clean up because you know, we really understand the market and what the market is looking for. And Not to, not to cut you off, but before, before New Line going into having been producing films for the first time and Alone in the Dark, you worked on The Burning, right? Which was not a New Line project at all. How did it well, actually, actually, Or did they have some connection actually, to it? Actually, the, the, the chronology was, I mean, I was working as an editor. And in addition to the stuff that I did for, for New Line, I, I cut a lot of documentaries and cinema during pay stuff. Um, so I had a really good feel for reality, and, 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 and I was really good at it. I mean, I, you know, if, 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 if there was anything that I really sort of had a, a, a God-given talent for, uh, it, it was really editing. Uh, I think the thing that informs all of my movies is the world well edited. Um, anyway, so what happened was uh, I came up with this, this idea for... Um, in the dark, which actually took place in, in uh, New York. The idea was that um, uh, there's this blackout and this maniac escape from a uh, high security mental institution, and the mafia rounds them up, and, and that was the story, and, and that was what they liked. And but they said, you know what? We really don't want to shoot it in New York City because it's too expensive. So let's let's forget about the mafia. Come up with something else. So I came up with the storyline, which is essentially what. Alone in the Dark is now, uh, and I wrote a script, and then they couldn't get the money together for it. And frankly, the script was not, the script was okay, it had a lot of the ideas there in Alone in the Dark, but it, 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 it really wasn't enough of a genre film. And then I got hired to do The Burning, so that was the chronology. And uh, the Burning was the first film that, that the Weinsteins did, and the people who owned uh, Miramax. They'd been in the music business, and they were a couple of unpleasant guys, which um, they, that hasn't changed. Um, and they bullied the director, and that hasn't changed. In fact, I, uh, I actually signed, somebody had a poster for it, and it said, created, produced and created by Harvey Weinstein, which is not a credit to him. <laughs> produced and created by BGA film. Uh, but um, I really learned a lot about how to cut a car film. Like, uh, uh, I so you were on set too, right? I was I was on on the set. We were up in we, we were staying in a uh, lovely place right outside of Buffalo called the Packet Inn. <laughs> All American hotel, and uh, uh, yeah, so I I hung out. You know, I was on the set a lot, and I saw a bunch of stuff they did. And then I, I was I was kind of cut away, but um, what I was famous in the film where the, it's a highly original concept, which is a bunch of people in a summer camp with a maniac. Except in this instance, the maniac music, so hedge cutters, hedge buffers. Um, anyway, so they're, they're all going on this camping trip down the river, and they see this canoe, and the canoe is just sitting there in the middle of the lake, and they paddle on, paddle on, and they get closer and closer and closer, and finally they get there, and the maniac jumps up and kills them all with hedge cutters. Uh, and I edited the thing, and I, I, I was really good at it. I mean, I really just, and, and it was so well edited. And I looked at it and said, you know what? This isn't any good. It's one of you, the world's too short. Make it longer. Well, okay, so I started in the morning. 
No, to make it longer. Keep, and they kept having me make it longer and longer. Um, and, and what I learned is, because they were right, I mean, as unpleasant as Harvey Weinstein would be, he had this, he had a really good instinct for how to do this. And, you know, um, you know, it's, it's the whole Hitchcock thing. I mean, uh, if you want to look at story construction, basically everything is either suspense or surprise. It basically has to do with whether, who knows whether the audience is in front of the story, whether they know what's going to happen next, or whether they're behind the story and they don't know what's going to happen next. And that is the basic tension in storytelling. And so, and suspense is better than surprise, because surprise is great. It happens, it's over, right? You know, the thing bursts out of the chest in aliens. It's great, right? Um, but suspense goes on for a much longer time. So usually suspense is better than surprise. And so what I, I learned this great lesson about how to build a scare. Because the longer you built it, the longer you built it, the longer you built it, the more you built up this head of steam so that then when the guy pops up and you get the surprise, it really works better. So I really learned a great deal from cutting that film. And, and as soon as I was done, I, I, I said, you know, I really got to go back and rewrite Alone in the Dark because it's missing all this stuff that it should have. And I went back and wanted to rewrite and I amped a lot of it up. And then we ended up getting money and I went on to uh, do the film. Now you're still, a, you're a young director at this time. How old are you? I was 35. <laughs> okay, so you're in your 30s and you're directing in your very first movie as a director, Donald Pleasant. And was that daunting? Uh, yes. It was, um, I was, uh, I was very nervous because I thought he was one of the greatest actors in the world. And I was th thrilled to have him, you know, I also had Martin Lane. <coughs> I had Jack Adams. And the Sick Fucks, who did not win an Academy Award, <laughs> but put out a decent record. Right, I had a great band, uh, we were looking for a band, and we found a band called the Sick Bucks, uh, who actually had a song in the repertoire called Shop Up Your Mother. <laughs> I had another one called uh, Insects Rule My Mind, but I didn't think that was part of it. And, 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 and actually the band, uh, if, if, uh, if you've seen them, there were like two slutty nuns in the band, you know, like torn carouels and... They were, they were pretty entertaining. Um, and, and I also had Jack Pals, and, and, and he was the guy that, that really scared me. Um, <laughs> I, I basically, uh, he had been hired to do the film, and then, probably at a low point in his career, and then, in the intervening time, he had gotten the show called Ripley's Believe It or Not, that... that uh, uh, and during the time that we were be shooting in the cold of New Jersey, we wanted him to go to uh, Florence to shoot this thing. So he wanted to back out of the movie, and he wouldn't make it back out. So he was in a really bad mood. Um, uh, in addition, he thought that he was playing the Donald Pleasant's part. Um, who was the psychiatrist as opposed to the crazed killer, which is the way many times didn't particularly want to play. And in addition, he had been told by the producer that there wouldn't be, there'd be hardly any night shoot. It was called Alone in the Dark. 